and is going to stand in John's shoes and teach us what thus said the Lord. Use him for your glory, Lord. And Lord God, I also want to just pray for our Sunday school classes. I pray that you might just um, challenge people, can convict people's hearts, Lord God. Lord God, and, and we all know we're not worried about numbers uh, the, uh, the size of Sunday school classes, but we're concerned about spiritual growth. So Lord God, we just pray that you might just convict hearts, convict hearts, Lord, and challenge people to come to Sunday school and Bible study so they can grow spiritually. And Lord God, as a result of us leaving these four walls today, Lord, my prayer is that we are better equipped to worship and serve you outside these four walls. Wherever you may lead us, Lord, we, we, may we be a light in this lost and dying world. We thank you in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Amen. Lord. Amen. Uh oh, I've got a mile. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise God. We'd like to uh, thank everyone for their voices and devotion and praise and worship. And um, more and more of God. Amen. Amen. Thank, we thank our musicians and uh, those who participated, giving God the glory. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together today. Thank you for your holy, precious word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who enables us to understand, opens the eyes of our understanding that we're able to see and grasp the word of God. I ask, Father, you help me to make it plain that we understand it as we look at your holy word. May we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This we ask in his name. 
for his sake. Amen. Amen. The message today, we're continuing in 1 Corinthians. In the first four chapters, the Apostle Paul dealing with human beings and the, the excessive uh, prominence that they put in the church at Corinth on human leaders, human beings. And Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 3, we cannot bring cr increase. We, don't, we can't bring life. We can plant and water. So he says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, and the message for today is defiling the local church. Defiling the local church. Now, again, the local church is defiled by human wisdom. That's how it is defiled. And the churches, many churches are so defiled that the churches don't know it. And you know that your church is defiled when you operate by what you think. The Bible says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So if I'm operating the church as a pastor by what I think, and years ago we started this stuff about a pastor casting his vision, and, uh, and people, oh, man, we got to have a vision. Got to cast a vision for the church. That's what you think. Vision is not cast. Vision is caught. So uh, prophet uh, with Daniel, the prophet Nathan, uh, you know, Dan, uh, not Daniel, David. David says, I'm going to build a temple. I, I got all his plans. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. The prophet said, well, David, you're the king. Uh, you're a good man. Do whatever you want to do. Go ahead. But he got a vision. The prophet got a vision. And when he got a vision, then his mind changed. And he said, David, you can't do this. And so if David would have done that and the prophet had okayed that, David is operating on, on human wisdom. This is what I think should be done. Everybody else got a house. God should have a house. And God, when he revealed what he was thinking, he said, I don't need a house. Everybody else got a house because they got to live you know, on this earth. Where I don't live on this earth. How are you going to build me a house on the earth when I surpass heaven and earth? And so his thoughts were higher than David's thoughts. Amen. The apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus. And uh, he was doing what he thought was right until the Lord Jesus Christ met him and uh, shined brighter than the noonday sun. And Paul says, for the rest of my life, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. What defiles the church is human wisdom. You know, uh, you can, uh, when, when my grandchildren come by, I say, hey, what's the house smell like? Because you can be in your house and not smell stuff. You've seen it, you ever seen that commercial? You seen that commercial? <laughs> you in your house, <laughs> you don't smell nothing. Somebody else walk in and go, whoa, this stinks in here. <laughs> Your house is defiled, but you've been in it, and you, don't, you can't tell the difference. It's okay with you. And so the problem with defilement is that in the churches, we get so, we get so used to human wisdom, and that human wisdom becomes the normal way of, of our uh, living and of our operating things that we think is normal. And it's not normal. It's defiled because it's human wisdom. So Paul says, do you not know, which means you, you, know, you should know this. You mean you don't know this? You ought to know this, that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 3.17 says, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, in those first two verses, again, he's talking about the local church. So when he says that the Spirit of God dwells in you, he's not talking about individually the Spirit of God dwelling in my body, dwelling in your body. He's talking about the Spirit of God dwelling in the church to lead us and guide us according to what he is saying and not according to what we're thinking. So he says, don't you know you, you plural, you are the temple of God. Temple of God, that means it's a place to worship. You worship God in the temple. 
See, Paul is talking to people, and he's talking to folks in Corinth, and he is a reference to the Old Testament temple. What happened in the Old Testament temple was worship, and it was worship the way God designed. It was not the way human beings come up with. And the church of Jesus Christ, the local local assembly, is to conduct itself based upon the word of God, not upon what we think should be happening in the church of Jesus Christ. So he has in view the local church, and uh, he's contrasting that with 1 Corinthians 6, where he says your body is the temple. That's individually. You come to Jesus Christ, your body is the temple. But here in the church, when we meet together, whether it be on Sunday mornings, Wednesday, uh, whether it be for deacons and trustees meeting, whenever we gather together, we are the temple of God, which means we need to be worshiping God in all our decisions and all our actions. Everything ought to come out of worship. Nothing should come from human wisdom and understanding. Everybody with me? And so, again, and I said, let me just back up and say one thing. So even a lot of stuff that we do in churches is human wisdom. So when I started here, and uh, you know, I used to say, somebody said, well, you know, you got to operate the church by Robert's rules of order, human wisdom, parliamentary procedure. I said, who is Robert? <laughs> why do I, why, I mean, why would we operate the church by Robert? Robert ain't died for no church. See, human wisdom, but, but when, you jo- when you get involved in churches, that's what they, Robert's Rules of Order and Parliamentary Procedure. And you're going, is that, is that what Jesus did with the disciples? He said, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. My face is set like a flint. I'm going to Calvary. Here's what's going to happen. Let's sit down and take a vote on that. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And so human wisdom destroys or defiles the church, the local church. And what God says in 1 Corinthians 3, 17, if anyone defiles the temple of God, again, a temple, the temple, he uses the word temple because God dwells with the Holy Spirit, dwells with us. We're meeting today, the Holy Spirit is with us. And so uh, there's nothing that we want to do that will be humanistic, human wisdom, and those kinds of things. What we want to do is worship the true and living God. I was saying, I heard this week, uh, one, one lady, was uh, she called in on a, on a Christian show, and, uh, and she made a good point, but she didn't, I don't think, I might have shared this with you, but she didn't really understand what she was saying. Because she said this, she said, you know, I, where I live, I'm labeled. I'm labeled as a liberal. She says, I'm not really a liberal, but I'm labeled as a liberal. She says, I don't think we Christians should be labeling one another. And I'm, you know, you know. She said, we shouldn't be labeling one another. That's because I may see something a little different than you, but why would we label? We all ought to be followers of Christ. And then she said, uh, and see, when we follow Christ, she said, one thing I found out about Christ, Christ was a socialist. And I said, wait a minute. You just let you, you don't want to be labeled, and you just labeled Jesus. See, human wisdom. And I said, Look, you know, let me take what, what the Bible says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh. Jesus is the eternal Word, He's the I am, He's before Abraham, He's God the Son, He declared out God. If you've seen Him, you've seen the Father. You know, let me go on and take, uh, when he was born, the Bible said we beheld his glory. Jesus Christ is God. What do you mean he's a socialist? I don't, uh, he's, he's not a capitalist. He's not a socialist. He's not an independent. He's not under human system. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. We, I mean, and so we defile him. You bring him down. Uh, now, don't, don't, don't label me, but I'm going to label Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, and I got a name which no one knows but me myself. He still, he still has not been uncovered. Even in the book called The Uncovering, the book of Revelation, 
where he is revealed as to who he is, he still comes out of heaven with a name that no one knows. Woo! That's my God. That's my God. He's not, he's not, under, not under any institution. And so the local church, when you, when you bring Jesus down to the humanistic level, the human wisdom, defi the wisdom defiles it. He defiles it. He's beyond our thinking. He's beyond our thinking. So when I want to sing about him, you know, God who is beyond our galaxy. He's the true and living God. And so you can go on and on. Matter of fact, the disciples, when the disciples got a view of him, and when he turned up, when he t uh, calmed the storm, they said, what manner? <laughs> you can't describe it. I don't want to go too far because I get into S.M. Lockridge. That's my God. You remember S.M.? Uh, he did that four-minute thing about his, about his God? Yeah. Well, look, we have to show that again sometime. That's my God. So to defile the temple of God is to bring uh, human wisdom into, the, into his thinking, into his meetings. And the rest of these verses, 18, 19, and so forth, will explain that what God does with human wisdom. Now it says God will destroy him, 1 Corinthians 3, 17. The word destroy is the same word that uh, is translated in the first part of that verse, defile. The idea is to come to ruin. And so listen, if you're living by human thinking, your life is going to come to ruin. If you're conducting the church of Jesus Christ by human reasoning, the church is going to come to ruin. And you see, the church at Revela in Revelation, the church at Laodicea is operating, but Jesus is not in it. Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, I'm standing at, at the door. I'm knocking. If anybody will overhear my voice, open the door, I'll come in and sup with that person. So the church in, in, uh, in uh, Laodicea has got everything they need but, but Jesus. See, and the more you get focused on human wisdom, that's how you live. You, you know, you live with everything that you think you need or you want, but you don't have Jesus. And you're living, but the Bible tells us that that only lasts for a little bit of time. How about the church at Sardis? They had a name that they were alive, but they were dead. Human wisdom. When human wisdom prevails, then you're not spiritually alive supernaturally to do what you're called to do. Let me move on here. So 1 Corinthians 3.18 says this, Let no one deceive himself if anyone among you seems to be wise in this age. Amen? See, when you come to church, and the church is to be holy, don't bring the wisdom of this world to say this is how we're going to run the church. You, you don't do that. And the, and the reason he says you're deceiving yourself because you think you're wise in this age, and Paul says, let him become a fool that he may become wise. And by what, what, he, what he means by a fool, the world thinks you a fool. So in the sight of the world, you're not that smart. You're not that intelligent. You know, you got, you got so-called intelligent, intelligent people say, all Christians are people who can't make life. They can't make it in life. So they got to find the crutch. So Jesus is their crutch because they're not strong. All Christians, and I hear people say Christians are, uh, they're just lightweights. They don't know how to think for themselves. And so they, so they conjure up this Jesus thing who will think for them. So, and I say, you can call me a fool all you want. But like I say, I, I told you the, uh, uh, the story about the guy criticizing the way I live, but, uh, but on payday, I got a full paycheck, and, and his check went to his wife because they garnished his wages because he wasn't making <laughs> Uh, who the fool now, bro? <laughs> who the fool now? You see, <laughs> you got a stub. I got a check. <laughs> so the Bible says, don't deceive, him, don't deceive yourself. And then 1 Corinthians 3, 19, the Bible says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Amen. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. Amen. In other words, people think they're getting over. 
but they're not getting over. How are you going to outsmart God? How are you going to outsmart a being that knows everything and has always known everything and can, and, and can never learn anything new because he's always known it from the beginning? How are you going to outsmart him? <laughs> so he said he takes the wise in their own craftiness. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know how uh, it, it, when you're playing sports or you wrestle, box or something, uh, playing basketball, baseball, baseball, one of the things you want to do is get your opponent off balance. And so a person may be strong, and, and then so he, he'll make his best move with all kind of strength. But if you, if you learn just how to slip a little bit, then that strength is used against him because he can't control it. The Bible says God takes those who think they are educationally, economically, financially strong, and, and they think they got it made. He, says he catches them in their own foolishness, their own wisdom. Verse 20, 1 Corinthians 3, 20. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the futile, that, of the wise, that they are futile. And again, verse 20, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, those who claim to be wise. And they are futile. They don't amount to anything. They don't amount to anything. Everybody still with me? You know, one of the greatest books to read is Ecclesiastes. I mean, Ecclesiastes, they're nothing new under the sun. Without God, what are we? And, and, and so the writer, King Solomon, will write, he said, let me tell you something. Uh, you know, you hear you, get, you got a name. You, you are the head of Facebook. You're the head of, you know, you um, uh, got all these titles. You got all these riches and wealth. But if there is no God, when you die, you know different than a dog. <laughs> Solomon says, and let me tell you something. He said, you gained, you gained all these resources, all this money you set up. What happens when you die? You give it to a fool. <laughs> because the nature, you see, it takes, you got to work hard to get stuff. And then when you give it to somebody who ain't worked hard at all, then they don't appreciate what it takes and they blow it. <laughs> so Solomon said, this is all futile. It's vanity. It's emptiness. So w without God, what are we doing? And so no matter what I, what I accumulate over my lifetime, and I live to be 74, 80, whatever it is, 90, no matter how long I live without God, if there's no God, when I die, I'm done. But thanks be unto God. We're not living life under the sun without a God. We got a God, so when we die, we're absent from the body, present with the Lord. So the thoughts of the wise who think they're wise without Jesus, they're futile. They're going to end up as vanity because everybody, everybody, all of us are heading toward the cemetery. You know, and now, you, know, you know, now folks say, well, I ain't going to the cemetery. I want to be cremated. You're still gone. <laughs> You're still gone. <laughs> Amen. And I, I'm, I, I, still plan on, I still plan on going to the cemetery. Yeah, I, I know uh, people have asked me, what, you know, should I be cremated? I said, well, there's no Bible verse that says you can't, but uh, I'm going in faith. The Bible says we lowered into the ground and, and then we're buried. We're, we do that in faith, looking forward to the rapture when one day when we'll, we'll be caught up to meet, be with the Lord. So that'll happen if you're cremated, but I just think the burial shows a better picture for me of uh, my life is not over. Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, I've accepted Christ. I'm born again. And uh, I may die. One of the verses I have uh, at the tombstone for my wife is, is this. It says, John chapter 11, he who believes in him shall never die. And at different times when I go by, I go by and read that and praise God. I start to shout and sing. So yeah, her body's there. But God, uh, Jesus promised, he said, Mary, I promise you this. If you are alive and believe in me, you'll never die. So she died physically, but she's not going to die eternally. Amen. Amen. She's with the Lord and Savior right now. Amen. And uh, I got a picture of that when she went home to be with the Lord because uh, I couldn't hardly understand her. And, and I got real close and she's talking. I'm talking to her. And uh, when I'm talking to her and she's kind of nodding, 
And then all of a sudden her eyes go up and she looks and she's gone. And, uh, and Jason said, I just saw my mother go to heaven. And um, it, was, it was a clear picture where she was talking to us on earth. She was responding. But then when the clarion call, <laughs> come on up. She left that body and went to be with the Lord. My sister was there. Amen. She left her body. The thoughts of the wise are futile. Now look at this. It says in First. 1 Corinthians uh, 2.12, I mean, I'll back up one scripture, 1 Corinthians 2.12. See, you and I are believers. See, here's how we want to live. It says, now we, have not, we, now we have received not the spirit of the world. Amen. My brother, he's on the job back there. Not the spirit of the world. You and I didn't, didn't receive that kind of spirit. But the spirit who is from God. It comes from, he comes from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. That's why there's some things that we know. Christianity is a no-so relationship. So we know some things other people don't know. Because in order to know, you've got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Since you don't have that relationship, you don't know. But we know. You've got the spirit of the world, which leaves Jesus out. We've got the spirit that comes from God, the Holy Spirit, who communicates to us who the Father is, what the Son is all about, and therefore we have freely been given these things, and we know that we know. Woo! Hallelujah. And notice what it says. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3.21. 1 Corinthians 3.21. So he'll see... Human wisdom defiles the local assembly. Don't bring that weak stuff in here, as Austin Carr would say. <laughs> Don't bring that weak stuff in here. Uh, you know, we're going to swat that away. But 1 Corinthians 3.21 says, Therefore, let no one boast in men. You see that? First chapter, second chapter, third chapter, the fourth chapter. He's got to deal with this because that's our tendency as human, men, human beings to boast in other people. Bragging about other people. And one of the things that I, and, and with my uh, young preachers, I say, you know, there's a tendency. You know, I mean, because some people, if they're not really into the Lord, they look and they say, just like what we see in Scripture, some are going to say, I like the pastor. Some are going to say, I like Rich. Some are going to say, I like Wayne. None of us can save anybody. <laughs> so, you know, and, and so when you, when you need saved, you better know Jesus. <laughs> Because any, any of us, you know, so, so I'll be, I'm here for a while, and pretty soon I'm going to be gone. So you, I can say that, you know, I, I watered what was already here. Somebody else planted it. I didn't plant this church. Somebody else planted it. I watered it, and somebody else is going to come after me. And so these last weeks I've been talking about, again, uh, what we need is to continue to stay with the Spirit of God. And I'm going to say it again. The way we choose pastors is human wisdom. It's not biblically, it's not, it's not, it doesn't come from God. Because if you looked at First, uh, First Timothy 3, 2 and 3, and you look at the qualifications of a pastor, you go by that, now you're going by the revelation that God has given. Not because you like the way someone can stand in the pulpit. Yeah, years ago, before God called me to pastor here, I, I, was, I spoke at a church, and the chairman of the trustee board came to me, and he says, he says, there, preacher Davis, uh, he said, minister Davis, he said, man, we're he said, we're going to put you in for this church because I just love the way you stand tall in that pulpit. <laughs> he said, and you, and you don't even have a robe yet. When I put a robe on you, you're going to look good. <laughs> I, I said, the brother ain't heard a word I said. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we choose them. That, that's, that's how I, we choose them. And so... <laughs> And, and, and so, that, I mean, we do a lot of things by human wisdom. I, I mentioned, I know I'm, I'm repeating some things. So he says here in uh, 1 Corinthians 3.21, Therefore let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. All things are yours. So P Paul comes to the settled, concrete conclusion. Don't brag about, don't get into human beings, men and women. Don't get into us. Get into Jesus, okay? And he says here in verse, uh, at the end of verse 21, all things are yours. 
Notice, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3.22, because here's what he says, all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, that's a Syrian name for Peter, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. See, in the church of Jesus Christ, all belong to us. Now, notice, uh, first of all, he says that, uh, that Paul, Apollos, or Cephas. The apostles were made for the church, and the church was not made for the apostles. Here's what I mean by that. God, God created, Jesus said, when he started, he said, upon this rock I'll build my church, not my apostles. He builds a church. He calls apostles as gifts to the church. So my job is to be a supernatural gift to the church. God didn't call friendship for me. He called me for friendship. It's a big difference. That's a big difference. I'm called to minister to be someone who will show forth God's praises and to demonstrate who Christ is. So the church is more important than the minister. Because that's, it, you know, Moses wasn't, uh, God didn't call Israel to Moses. He called Moses to Israel. And, and so Paul says, you, you know, you so, you're bragging about men so much that you don't understand that it's God who's bringing the increase. Quit boasting in human beings. This making sense to you? Three chapters, you know, quit boasting in human beings. Because God can take anybody and cause him to be successful. And so 1 Corinthians will say that's what he normally does. He doesn't take the nobles. He doesn't take the most intelligent people in the world. He takes those who are common. And he uses them for his glory. So all things are yours. Okay, that's the apostles. Now he says the world belongs to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31, the Bible tells us, it says, here's how we live our lives. If you're single, you know, live, and tr and live in such a way that you are glorifying God. If you marry, then you live in such a way that you're glorifying God. And, then, and he says, listen, the, this earth, you know, time is passing away. All of us know that. We look back and we say, man, it seemed like a couple years ago when uh, our kids were young. Now they grown. They got their own kids. We got grandkids. You see all this kind of thing. He says the world is passing away. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31, he says, use the world, but don't misuse the world. 1 Corinthians 7, 31. See, and those who use this world as not misusing it. So uh, uh, use the world. In other words, See, uh, all the human teachers belong to us in the church. And the world belongs to us. And what we've done by human defilement is we're trying to get politicians on our side rather than using the world for the glory of God. And so wherever we go, we're the head and not the tail. And so we use the world, okay? We use the world and... Uh, and, and, I, and I say this, uh, that uh, I, I started going back down to the YMCA. God laid on my heart. I, I needed to be involved with unsaved people. So I use the Y. I go to the restaurants. I use the, I use the restaurants. Everywhere you go, you go in and you, and you pray. My brother Brian, he uses the buses. I, I mean, wherever we go, it's, it's, it's the world. God has put us in the world. And there's opportunities to show forth Christ. And uh, someone was saying about my brother, my buddy Marvin and I, I said, and when y'all come down to the wild, you make a difference. Uh, and uh, when you're not here, we miss you. And again, the world belongs to us in the sense that God opens doors for us to represent Christ. And so I, don't, I never go anywhere, never go anywhere thinking that, you know, well, the world is above you. No, you own it. But the Bible says all things are yours. Paul said, I, the, I gave you teachers for the church. I gave you the world. Use it. Use it. Amen. So wherever, wherever we go, whatever happens, uh, we use it. There's an opportunity to represent Christ. And that's, that's the whole idea. The world is passing away. But the word of God will never pass away. Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but not my words. So as believers, what we, have been, uh, what we have not been taught is to use the world. 
to use the world. And so uh, wherever uh, uh, that we go, you know, we come down here or different places, there's always opportunity to show forth the praises of our Lord and Savior. The the song that uh, uh, our brother sings, and, you know, it's it's an older song, and, you know, it's just we don't think much of it, but this little light of mine, that's the idea. Wherever you go, you let your light shine. And when you let your light shine, then you don't know how God is going to use that. So it's not, I'm not, so we're not called to misuse the world. We're called to use the world. So you see what I'm saying? So I, I go to the Y, I go to the restaurant. Uh, when I went to uh, General Motors, I, you know, you use the world. Right? And so God says, set up a Bible study. So I set up a Bible study. He brings people to a Bible study, you know, and uh, different things that happen because you're using the world for the glory of God. Is this making sense to you? Amen. Amen. And so people say, but you know what? On my job, I'm the only one. I'm the only Christian. I mean, the whole world is against me. Yeah. And God in one is a majority. If you got God, you got more than enough. And, and just start where God tells you. Amen. You don't, I mean, you don't have to start. Just start where God tells you. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And so the world belongs to us. He says, life or death and things present or things to come. Well, Paul says in Romans 8, 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, none of that's going to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So as long as God gives me breath, whether it's life or whether it's death, and I, and I thought, yeah, life or death. You said, well, when you're dead, you're gone. Yeah, but you still got all the things that you instilled in your children. My grandfather died in 1989, but there's stuff that I'm still, I'm still putting into practice because of the way he lived his life. So he's dead, but he's still in, in, impacting us. And so uh, friendship, and that's the other thing we're looking at, 100 years. If God doesn't give us another year, we, can, we still will be impacting society because we've been here. So life or death. And then he ends, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 23, this is the, the end of chapter uh, 3, and uh, the message. See, we def- the church is defiled by human wisdom. Human wisdom is we depend upon our own energy rather than the supernatural transforming power of God of God. So I look at myself and I say, well, look, God saved me. <laughs> if he saved me, he can save you. <laughs> and if he saved you and he saved me, he can save other folks. It's, and there, there is no diminishing of his power. So what Peter, I mean, what Paul says, he concludes this thing. He says, let me help you understand this thing. All things are yours. He says, and you are Christ. Got that? And Christ is God's. So when you think about this thing, you are Christ and Christ is God. So Christ is God's. And in the relationship with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that is there for Christ is there for you and me in the relationship we have with Christ. You are Christ and Christ is God. So what did the Father say? This is my beloved Son who I'm well pleased. He says, I'm going to glorify you. All that in the relationship that the Father has with the Son, he has with you and me together as a body of believers. When you you stop to think about it, amen, amen. I I I I probably said this before, but they were talking about uh, some great uh, players, basketball players, and how great uh, players cause other folks to step it up, you know, to get better. Uh, (coughs) Excuse me. So <clears throat> as I was watching my Cavaliers last night, I never thought about much about a guy named Mark Rubio. I mean, Rubio, is it Mark? Uh, and so, but as I watch, uh, watch him, I'm going, man, something is changing on that team. I'd rather get on the floor and he starts passing the ball, looking for other players. And other players start stepping up. And, bef- and uh, then, and, and they were winning. They took him out, put another guy in who can score better than he can. Next thing you know, the lead diminishes. So they take that guy out and, and put Mark back in. 
And then the lead increases because everybody is involved. And here's what I'm saying, my brothers and sisters. We have influence. And when we live for the power of Jesus Christ and we live uh, in light of the word of God and the Holy Spirit, there's impact that we make. And when you're not around, people miss you because you bring in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's, Jesus said this. He said there are 12 hours in the day. And he was talking about daylight. He, he knew there were 24. <laughs> but, he said, but there's 12 hours, 6 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock at evening. He said there are 12 hours a day. And he said, and I must work the works of him who sent me. Nighttime is coming and no one can work. Brothers and sisters, that's my attitude. I want to work the works that God has sent for me. Again, no matter where it might be, because the nighttime is coming. But while there is day, Lord, help me to work your works and represent you. Because wherever I go, as Paul says, I'm a debtor to these folks who don't know Jesus. They don't owe me nothing, but I owe them the gospel. I want to live so God can, as a songwriter as we used to sing it in church back in the days, and I want to live so. God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. Amen. Amen. And so that's still how we want to live. That's still how we want to live, live so God can use me. And so I said, Lord, I'm, I'm 74. I'll be 75 in a couple months. I don't have the activity that I had when I was 47. But as much as you can use me, Amen. I'm still singing. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Use me, Lord, for your glory. Because all things belong to me. The world, teachers, everything. So I turn on the radio and I hear Tony Evans and say, man, Tony, whoa, that was good, Tony. And, and the scripture said, God says he belongs to you. I put him on so you would hear this and you grow. Praise God. The church uh, uh, here at Friendship, we belong to Christ. And we've made an impact in Gerard. And thanks be to God that we're not going to quit now. We're going to keep on and not allow the wisdom of human beings. The wisdom of human beings. Because if y'all bring, bring another pastor in here <laughs> full of, full of uh, human wisdom, I'm coming back. <laughs> well, you know that ain't true. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for what a wonderful uh, scripture in, in, in 1 Corinthians. And we don't want to defile the local church, but we want to fill the local church with your spirit. So guide us and direct us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. We'll be careful to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord.